thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here um, chatting with you, David. It's a real honor. You know, I've been a huge fan Same. of your work for for a, for a long time, and and I thought how to know a person was was, was just wonderful. It's fascinating, um, but also a, um, a compassionate book and a, and a, and, a, and, a, and a, quite a vulnerable book. You really do give something of yourself in this book. Yeah, I didn't start out that way, but my uh, first, I should say, I'm pleased and honored to be here with you. I've learned a lot from you. I've read and really admired the science of storytelling right here, the science of storytelling. Um, and um, yeah, so people, my my readers, my my initial readers um, said, you know, you got to put yourself in the book. And so as the process went on, as they hammered that, you know, you have to, if you're going to write a book about how to know a person, then if you're, it's not personal, then there's something wrong here. So I made it more about partly a little journey that I took um, and partly a, a journey that we're all taking. And, you know, the little journey I took was, I start the book by saying, if if you ever saw that movie Fiddler on the Roof, you know how warm and huggy Jewish families can be. And I come from the other kind of Jewish family, super cerebral. And I don't know if this is insulting to Brits, but the culture in our, the name of our culture was Think Yiddish, Act British. Mm. And so we were reserved. And so if you came to our house for dinner, you might hear a conversation about um, the history of Victorian funerary monuments or something like that, uh, the evolutionary sources of lactose intolerance. But you wouldn't see us like telling each other we loved each other. You wouldn't see a lot of emotional vulnerability. So uh, I needed to grow up uh, from that. So, yeah, I mean, you write about that quite movingly in the book about and you say that, you know, there was a family that didn't really express love and that growing up, you were quite aloof socially. You're an observer, which, of course, make, you know, tends to make for a great journalist. And and so earlier on in your life, how did that kind of Britishness uh, and the kind of aloofness, how, how did that sort of impact you personally and socially? Yeah, I mean, I tell journalism students, if you're at a football game and everyone is doing the wave, and you don't do the wave, you just sit there, then you have the right kind of aloof personality style to be a journalist, because <laughs> we we indeed don't do anything. We watch people uh, do stuff. Um, and so I think it helped me professional, frankly, I was was, was observer, uh, but it hurt me personally. In that, you know, I think I wasn't great at cultivating friendships. I was the sort of person who nobody, few people would confide in me, I didn't send in those vibe that you, you can really come to me with your problem. Uh, and I think it was a uh, people had a tr tough time knowing um, what I thought of them or and they had a tough time knowing me. I, I literally just two days ago had a conversation with a guy who was um, his daughter was in my son's elementary school class. And he said, I used to think you're so well, he mentioned what a lot of people mentioned to me. You're so different now. And he said, I used to think you really disliked me. Oh. I was like, no, I never had any negative thought, but I think I just projected. I mean, the the kind of attention you cast on the world determines your way of being in the world. And if you cast sort of a cold and rational form of attention, people are going to think you're cool and unfriendly and they, you don't like them. But if you cast a warm gaze, then there's something about that that brings out growth in people. And so the power of our gaze is just um, tremendous in, in shaping how people interpret us and how we see the world. Yeah, there's this great quote at the beginning of your book. I just got to read the quote quickly. He says that there's one skill that lies at the heart of any healthy person, family, school, community, organization, or society, the ability to see someone else deeply and make them feel seen, to accurately know another person, to make them to let them feel valued, heard, and understood. That is at the heart of being a good person, the ultimate gift you can give to your to others and to yourself. You know, that's a really profound um thing to say. And, and I wonder if you could sort of dig into that, because obviously that's that that's the heart of the book, it's the heart of your argument. I wonder if you could expand on that. And, and particularly because, you know, when I'm reading it, I'm thinking, is this is this just empathy? Is this a book about empathy, or is it deeper and richer than that? Yeah, I think it's deeper than empathy. Empathy, people aim people misunderstand empathy. To me, empathy is three different skills, so we put it to one phrase. The first skill is mirroring, catching the emotion that you are catching. So we're share, I'm, I'm sharing your emotion, whatever you're projecting. The second is mentalizing. It's me being able to say, well, I've had an experience similar to what he's going through, and so I sort of know what he's thinking. If it's your first day on the job, I sort of know what it's like to be a first day on the job. Uh, and so I can, and then the final is caring. And so we say con men are really good at reading other people's minds, but we wouldn't say they're empathetic because they don't care. <laughs> and so you got to be effective caring. So there's a, a little story in the book. One of my little favorites uh, was, I heard it from a rabbi, Elliot Kuklis, his name. 
And he said he had a, a congregant who had suffered a brain injury and she would sometimes just fall on the floor and she just fell on the floor. And she said, people always rush to lift me up from the floor because they find it so uncomfortable to see an adult on the ground. But sometimes I just want somebody to get down on the ground with me. And so that's empathy, knowing not what would make you comfortable, but would make the other person comfortable. And so empathy is a key here. But I don't think when I talk about seeing someone else deeply, um, I mean more than just empathy. So if I want to see you deeply, I really, you know, one of the things I learned from the science of storytelling is we all walk around with these models in our head of how we see reality. And if I want to see you deeply, I want to see a little how you see the world. And so I probably have to know a little about your personality type, which is knowing about how personalities work. I probably have to know a little about your ethnic heritage and how it's shaped how you see the world. I ideally would like to know about moments of suffering and how they've shaped how you see the world, whether you see with trusting eyes or distrustful eyes, traumatized eyes, or or just light and carefree eyes. And so it, it's beyond just empathy, and it involves a whole body connection, including an intellectual understanding of your models. Yeah, so it's obviously much, much deeper and much, much richer. And 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 as you say, it's at the you know it's it's at the heart of being a a good person. Is is this kind of is this kind of model that you outline of um you know seeing a person deeply? I mean, as, you, as you're talking, I'm thinking about there's the famous um, Coolidge um, definition of the self, and and that 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 phrase, the mirror self that he talks about, where he says that we are who we think other people think we are. And when you were speaking earlier about about your who you who you used to be a bit more the aloof person who who people people felt you didn't like them very much and that you were maybe judging them from a, from, from a distance. Do, do you think that then it then rebounded to your own self view? Did that did that affect how you perceived hmm. yourself that that perception? Yeah, I would say I I was just not. No, I probably my ego was fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, I think what had changed was that. I think I knew I had emotions, but I wasn't particularly familiar with them. And they certainly did not, there was no road between my heart and my mouth. <laughs> so I was not good at expressing the emotion. Uh, and so I think it was a process of becoming less uh, less emotionally reserved and a process of becoming familiar with emotion and familiar with expressing emotion. And frankly, when somebody comes to me with, I'm having a problem in my marriage or I'm having a trouble with my friendship, I don't panic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and so part of that is literally knowing the skills. You, you have to be open hearted to, to do this, but you just have to know set of social skills. Like how do you sit with someone who is suffering from depression? How do you sit with someone who's lost a loved one? How do you be a great conversationalist? How do you even end a conversation? Well, like I, I just thought like, how should you end a conversation? So it doesn't feel awkward. When, when I went to my first school reunion, it was the fifth re reunion, and I didn't know how to get out of conversations gracefully. And the only <laughs> go-to move I had was, I'm, I'm going to get another drink at the bar. So the classic, in, in, the classic. Yeah. So in 45 minutes into that reunion, I am so drunk out of my mind <laughs> that I have to leave if I go home. And I just didn't know how. So, you know, if you want to end a conversation gracefully, say, you know, I've really enjoyed talking with you. I'm particularly fascinated by what you said about X, pick something specific, and then say, it's been wonderful being with you. And that way you're ending a conversation by putting a little cherry on top of it. Yeah. Uh, and it's just a, a, a little technique. And so these, these are skills and the book tries to teach skills. And my assertion is that social skills are like carpentry or, or tennis. They're, they're skills one can learn. We're all born with a certain level of athletic ability in social life, but we can all get better and nobody's good without practice. Absolutely. I mean, but you, you also tell the story about how you, you changed from being this, this kind of you could call it blocked you know younger person and, and to the extent that even oprah winfrey herself commented on how much she changed um uh for, you know for, from one period of your life to another can you talk us through how you change you know what, what what about you changed but also what was the process what actually yeah. happened in your life to enable you to change yeah i think it was a gradual process at which i would start way back 2008 maybe uh, because i went to the University of chicago i wanted to learn about emotion i wanted to be more emotional so I wrote a book about emotion <laughs> and, and I sort of taught myself about emotion. And then around 2013, I went through a hard season in life. My kids were going off to school, university, and my marriage had dissolved. And I was sort of in a spot where I realized I was living in some dingy little apartment 
And I did what any male idiot would do when presented with a hard time in life, which was I tried to work my way through it, just be a workaholic. Uh, and so if you had gone into my my drawer in the kitchen, I wasn't inviting anybody over for dinner. So where, in that drawer, there were just post-it notes where there should have been silverware. And where there are, should have been plates, there was envelopes and other stationery. And so that symbolized to me a sort of life that I had a lot of work friends, but I didn't have those weekend friends. So it was like two in the morning, who are you going to call friends? And so I, I was lonely and uh, realizing there was some set of bad values I had been living by. Uh, and so I just went through this dark period. And there's a Paul Tillich phrase that uh, uh, moments of suffering interrupt your life and remind you you're not the person you thought you were. They wow. carve through the floor of the basement of your soul and reveal a cavity below, and they carve through that floor and reveal a cavity below. So in those hard moments, we just become more deeply aware of who we are. Uh, and um, I realized that only spiritual and relational food would fill that. And then I sort of got adopted by a family. Um, and I say family, I use the word advisedly. It was two, cup, two, two couples and then about 40 teenagers. And so they were sort of a chosen family, mostly for teenagers who had some disruption in their own family lives. And I went out to dinner with this, or this, or I went to dinner with this group of probably a bunch of teenagers and a few adults. Every Thursday for about six years, we did our holidays together. We did vacations together. And those kids were like, they were like sunflowers just turning their beam of attention and demanding emotional availability from you. Wow. And they really modeled for me a, a way of being of so... I got to the point like hugging and all this kind of stuff, like just like being open. And so I got to the point where I was at a conference about a year or two ago and they handed us lyrics, lyric sheet of a love song. And they said, pick a stranger and sing this love song to his eyes. <laughs> and oh. so <laughs> if you had asked my former self, to, I would have spontaneously exploded. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I did it. I did. I found some stranger. I sang a love song into his eyes. <laughs> and how was so, that? It was not the best thing in the world, <laughs> but I did it. <laughs> yeah, but you did it. You got through it, and and you, you know you you found that you you've become a a better, more rounded, more emotional, more social person. Yeah, and I think it really is once you. It's like anything when you know the skills, you know you feel comfortable in the arena. Yeah, and so knowing how to sit with someone like I describe in the book, sitting with my friend who was depressed, like how do you do that? Uh, how do you become a great conversationalist? What, you know, how do you ask for questions uh, in the right order? Like when I first meet somebody, you don't want to ask a deep question. So I often ask like, where are you from? Because I, I travel a lot. So I know a lot of childhood things. Or I ask them, where'd you get your name? That gets people talking about their their ethnic background. In po When talking politics, I never ask anymore, what do you think? Mm -hmm. I ask, um, how did you come to believe that? And that way they're mm -hmm. telling me a story about their some experience they had or somebody who shaped their values. And I even, I have a friend who's in London right now who lives there. Um, and I asked him just in a small group, we were just fooling around having a drink. Um, what's your favorite unimportant thing about yourself? Yeah, oh, that's lovely. And, and he's, he's like an impressive <laughs> theologian. So I thought, oh, wow, he's going to have something, but he watches way too much trashy reality TV. So that was his favorite unimportant thing about himself. Is, is this, is, is what you're describing? Because in the book you write about conversing with somebody in the narrative mode rather than the kind of standard mode of maybe asking closed questions. Is this what yeah. you're describing here? Yeah, so that that's one way of trying to get them into narrative mode. And one of my favorite stories is, uh, it wasn't, I got it from another book called You're Not Listening by a writer named Kate Murphy. And she describes this focus group person and moderator who had been hired by grocery stores to figure out why people come to the grocery stores late at night. And she doesn't ask the question that way. Instead, she asks, she takes the focus group and says, tell me about the time, last time you went to the grocery store after 11 p.m. And there's some quiet lady who hadn't said anything in the whole focus group said, well, I'd smoked a joint and I want a menage a trois with me, Ben and Jerry. And so she tells a little story. And so you're, you're getting a little window in yeah. her life. And it's, yeah. it's a better way to ask questions. It's a much more vivid way of meeting somebody, isn't it? Like you really feel, you know, uh, you, you really get a feel for who they are in a, in a much... Um, kind of better way um so just sort of talking again about your the, the journey that you've been on through your life you, you've said elsewhere in a, in another piece um i think it was an interview with you where you, you say when i look at videos of my earlier self i think wow i'm really not that guy anymore which is a good thing 
although I suffer a lot more. I was much happier when I was super shallow. I didn't have any bad emotions. I wasn't sad in the morning, so it's kind of good. I'm so pleased to be shallow. Now I'm burdened with the world problems. So, so it's interesting because it doesn't it doesn't sound all that good. Like it's not an an, an, an alloy benefit. This kind of program that you're, uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, that you're, you're promoting. Yeah, my next book is how to go back to being extremely shallow. <laughs> they say it's going to be called Goldfish, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it, it, it's, I, I'm reminded of, of that question. I have been teaching on and off uh, at American universities. And my student, my courses, one of them was about how to make the big commitments in life. And it was mm. for 21 year olds. And it really was, my students all just called it therapy with Brooks because we just filled <laughs> our guts to each other. Um, but um uh, one after one uh, term, one of my students, one of my best students, who had just been awarded a Rhodes Scholarship, um, says to me, "You know, Professor Brooks, I really enjoyed the class. It's made me much sadder." Uh, <laughs> and, and I took that as a win, because here was this superstar guy who hadn't done much reflection upon himself. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I have more feelings, and I have more feelings of sadness, but I also have more feelings of joy and happiness. And I also have, you know, a wonderful relationship with my wife. And we just had Thanksgiving here in the States. And the, and my wife um, said, you know, my attitude toward my kids is is way different than it used to be. And my posture toward them. So, you know, one of my heroes is a guy named, a novelist named Frederick Beekner, And he says, what we want most in life is to be seen in our fullness. Yeah. And what we fear most is to be seen in our fullness. <laughs> and, 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 but he, you know, his life, which is sort of a model for mine was really a life of emotional repression to a life of, of emotional engagement. And I wouldn't want to go back. I wouldn't want to be this low, you know, no man is an Island. So I, I wouldn't want to go back and be the Island. I wanted to, cause we, we, we've both had some of the backgrounds in that we're both journalists in, you know, I've spent years meeting a huge array of people and, and really, you know, spending good three or four hour hours with me an intense yeah. conversation and I certainly believe it's changed my life it's changed how I see other people um it it, it has massively increased my sense of I feel just to sort of my understanding that you can be very wrong about other people yeah. and that you can misunderstand them and you know we're not, not, I know we're not strictly talking about empathy here but it's, de it's definitely increased my sense of empathy with other people it, 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 it it's taught me a lot about the vast range of experience there is around the world and, and that people that might you might dismiss as being stupid or ignorant over a tweet are actually coming from a, a place of complete sincerity in a, in a place that you might not quite understand. I mean, is, has that been your experience too? Because I, I feel like reading um, How to Know a Person that this is, it's, it, it almost feels like the book by a seasoned journalist, a person who's been around the world and met a lot of people and, and, and had that a, a similar kind of, um, almost brutal education in in this is what it's like to be a human yeah no i'm i'm um, very proud of our profession because you know academics do studies mm. and i rely on a lot of studies and i have learned a lot from studies and studies are great for understanding populations of people but journalism our gold standard is the interview it's we we ask people questions uh, and i think it's it's that's the way to understand each particular person because every individual is more fascinating than the studies you read about groups of people. And so like I heard about a woman who was a who was a at a Trump rally and she was a lesbian biker who converted to Sufi Islam after surviving a plane crash. And so like what stereotype does she fit into? Um, she is not your typical Trump. But most nobody is your typical Trump supporter, your triple labor supporter or whatever. Uh, everybody's more interesting than their stereotype. And one of the great sins we do. Uh, is called stacking, which is when you learn one fact about a person, you make a whole series of assumptions about who they must also be. And stacking is really a, a terrible way to, you know, miss the truth and not see someone. And so I I thank you for, because we do do a lot of journalism. And one, I put this question to you. I, I would say in my career as a journalist, basically 35 years of asking people questions about them, how many times have they said to me, none of your damn business? And if I've found the answer is zero, and if you ask people respectfully about their life story, they're dying to tell you their life story and that nobody's ever asked them. I don't know if you've, your experience is very different than that. It, uh, it is the same, except with the, with, with the caveat that, that it, 
which is the most depressing form of journalism there is. I used to sometimes have to interview celebrities. So believe yeah. me, asking Katy Perry about her marriage problems with Russell Brand is going to get you none of your damn business. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but okay. with that, we, we, you know, we, we did it awful, you know, like you feel so awful as, as the journalist asking those nosy questions. Yeah. But yeah, absolutely. When it, when it's non-celebrity, 100% of the time, people want to talk to you about this stuff. They, they they want to tell you their story. And that's, again, something else you write about in How to Know a Person, that, that, that that's that's what we want. You know, p- p- people love to tell their story. It, it, it um, And actually, as you also write, you know, one of the things that journalists and also therapists do is they help people compose their narrative. And, you know, you yeah. can feel yourself when you're in a deep conversation with somebody, you're helping them make sense of this crazy thing, that journey that they've been on that you're talking to them about. Yeah, you know, no, very few of us, unless we're memoirists, sit down and consciously write our life story. We, we get to compose it as when somebody asks us. Uh, and so what's story, what therapists are, I learned this from a therapist named Lori Gottlieb, therapists are story editors. Usually people come to therapy because their story isn't working, often because they get causation wrong. They br- blame themselves for things that are not their fault, and they blame others for things that are their fault. And so with a, in therapy, they go over and over with the therapist, and the therapist is like, well, didn't you leave that out? Uh, and they try to get a, them to tell a story in which the patient has agency, when the patient has power. Oh, interesting. And everything a therapist do does, a friend can do. And therapists, I learned this through the book. I thought they would have some special curriculum on how to know another person, but no, they're just, they've been around the block a few times. And so they, they've they seen so many people, they can, they're usually a couple steps ahead. But any friend can do that too, just by saying, is that really part of your story? Is that really what you want? And so when I'm listening to stories, I'm wanting to know, like, who's the hero here? Like, yeah. how do they portray themselves? Like, some people are the fighter. Some people are the healer. I think I'm the student. I think that's, we all have an interview style. Like, my, my style is more, I'm a student, educate me. Some people are seducers in an interview, uh, but I'm I'm the student, so I want to I want to hear what what their social role is, and then I want to hear like what's the plot here, how do they describe the narrative of their lives, and there's a guy who studies this at Northwestern named Dan McAdams, and he he wrote a book called the the Redemptive Self, and his argument was that most of us tell stories as redemption stories. Mm-hmm. We were on the path, something bad happened, we came back better, we were redeemed. And so he, he writes this book and then he travels around the world. And I don't know if it's true of the UK, but he's traveling around the world saying, we tell stories as redemption stories. And a lot of parts of the world, people look at him like, what are you talking about? That's how Americans tell their lives. That's not how we tell our lives. And so other people have different plots in their culture that they tell their lives by. I think it's a very Western, I think I think it comes out of ancient Greece that, that I think it's very Western. I think definitely yeah. in the UK, because I read The Redemptive Self too, and that was one of my the criticisms of it really this is not just america this is the west this is the story yeah. of western individualism this is the story yeah so that that was my takeaway I, th- I think that's a very western individualist tale that yeah we i this individual uh, encountered this obstacle and i overcame it and victory was mine or, <laughs> right. or um or, or of course disaster and failure was mine yeah um yeah. What, one of the really fascinating ideas and i think really useful ideas that you explore in your book is this this like this concept of diminishers versus illuminators i wonder if you can sort of describe um that for us yeah so a diminisher is someone who makes you feel unseen so he's not curious about you uh he stereotypes he ignores he's all about himself and you leave those people thinking like i've now have a rule if you invite me out to coffee and you lecture at me for 40 minutes without ever asking me a question or really being concerned that i exist uh we will not be enjoying each other's company again so i have just they're diminishers. There's just nothing you can do about it. They're, they're so into themselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, and illuminators are people who are curious about you. They ask about you and they look at you with eyes of respect and reverence and they invite you to really present your full and best self. And so two little illuminator stories I tell. One is for, about the novelist E.M. Forster, mm-hmm. who wrote about a hundred some odd years ago, I guess. Um, and his biographer wrote to him to be with Forster was to be seduced by an inverse charisma. He listened to you with such intensity, you had to be your best, most honest and sharpest self. Wow. And who wouldn't want to listen with that kind of intensity? And another story I tell is possibly apocryphal, but it makes a point. And it's told about Jenny Jerome, who would go on to become the mother of Winston Churchill. And she's having dinner in late 19th century England. Uh, and one night she's seated next to William Gladstone, the prime minister. And she leaves that dinner thinking that Gladstone is the cleverest person in England. 
Then sometime later, she's at another dinner and she happens to get be seated next to Gladstone's great rival, Benjamin Disraeli. And she leaves dinner with Disraeli thinking that she's the cleverest person in England. So the rule is it's good to be Gladstone, but it's better to be Disraeli, to listen to people so they feel like they're walking on there when they when they leave you. That's right. You you, you give status. I, I, yeah, absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. And so do you think you've always been an illuminator? Do you think you've had, you, we were once a diminisher? Do you think it's a um something that we can learn or do you think it's do, do you think it's a personality thing like our neurotics more diminishers like how, how does yeah. that all work i think it's definitely it's about focusing your attention uh, you know the, one of the heroes of the book is iris murdoch the novelist and philosopher and she says most of the times we look at each other with selfish eyes mm -hmm. we look at others as an object that we're going to use or there's some instrumental or transactional way but she says our goal should to be to cast a just and loving attention on others, to get, cast a gave of respect and reverence that we're going to see people for the for who they are, see them involved in a noble struggle. And that just and loving attention is a more um, gracious way of being in the world, a more generous way of being in the world. There's a phrase, every epistemology implies an ethic. Mm. The way you know the world implies your moral way of being in the world. And so you'd think I'd be a, you know, regular old Sigmund Freud after four years working on this book. And, you know, I have my moments, but then I have a couple of glasses of wine at a dinner party and I start blabbing funny stories about myself <laughs> or, you know, it's late at night and I'm on a plane and I don't, you know, I put my headphones in. I don't want to talk to a person, but more the average of my behavior is, is more. So, you know, even riding on a train or a bus or a plane, I'm way more likely to to talk to the stranger than I, I would have been before doing this because I learned from research how much fun it is and that's certainly been born out of my life so that's one like concrete way my life has changed I now talk to the strangers that are sitting next to me at a bar or something like that and hopefully leave them feeling like they're the smartest person in the world yeah right. and so you know <laughs> some of the times they you know I, I do this especially when I'm in a a very Trump centered part of America oh. uh, and I call it I call it reporting you would call it going to a bar and hanging out but uh but i i'm often i'm terrified they're going to ask me where i work because i'm going to say oh i work at the new york times and then the conversation is about to go south and big yeah. time but they never do so oh, right. <laughs> that's Good. one point when you get self-absorbed people they don't think to ask where what do you do <laughs> yes <laughs> so they'd be stacking you back you know yeah right um <laughs> Uh, you, you, you've gone through a, a very unusual journey. Um, I think it's unusual, converting from Judaism to Christianity. Um, how has how, how this shift in worldview, shift in almost moral reality, um, impacted the intellectual journey that you describe in the book? Yeah, I, I think it's more, I think of it more as coming to faith, coming from eight, 40 years of atheism to coming to believe in God. Okay. And so I grew up in a Jewish home. Mm. I was sent to an Episcopal school. Uh, and because it was New York City, uh, I was in the choir and 40% of us were Jewish. Uh, and so we would sing the hymns, but we wouldn't sing the word Jesus to square it with our religion. So the volume would drop in the church and, and then go on. Um, and so, but it was just two stories. I didn't come, I didn't believe in God. So it didn't seem, they were just two good wisdom traditions, really. Uh, but then round about age 50 or late 40s, my categories for reality did, didn't match the reality I perceived. Mm. I didn't perceive, I didn't have categories to match the occasional moments of transcendence, the feeling of an undercurrent of, of divine love. And mostly, you know, I, uh, if you know anything about New York, you know, the ugliest spot in New York is Penn station, the train station there. Oh. Well, it's the second ugliest spot. The actual ugliest spot is the subway station next to Penn station. Right. <laughs> and so one day I'm, I'm there in this crowded subway station. And it occurs to me that all these people have souls, mm. that there's some piece of them that has no size, weight, color, or shape, but gives them infinite value and dignity. Mm. And that we're not all equal on the level of our brain power or muscle power, but we're all equal on the level of our souls. Mm. And, um, you know, so their souls are yearning or some people have souls that are sick and some people have souls that are in raptures and that there's some spiritual essence to everybody me uh and so i i do think i i it led to this book in some way because it means that every person i meet is made in the image of god every person i meet i'm staring into the face of god and i'm trying to love them the ideal of human love is the way god knows us and the way god sees us which is not a cold detached 
gaze. It's a loving embrace. And so I think coming to faith influenced the book, though the book's not religious in any real way, uh, just because I, my belief is that having respect and reverence for every human soul you encounter, whether it's the person in the bar, the person at the cash out, the check cashier, the homeless person on the ground, that's a precondition for seeing them well. Yeah, there's some beautiful writing in the book about this. I loved when you were writing about how even if you're atheist, you should treat everybody as if they have a soul. I thought that was that was really moving uh, and, and, and you know very true. So 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 yeah, I think it, it, it's it's very clever how you um, you, you can certainly feel what you've just said. You can feel your Christian reality in the book, but it's not by any means a Christian book. It's a it, you, you don't talk about yeah. that you know that side of you very much at all. Um, you do touch touch upon some themes which you've written about in in other places, and 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 that includes some dismaying changes that have happened in the U.S. and by extension across the West. You know, we give less to charity these days. We're ruder. We're more depressed. Uh, we are, as is well known, very uh, much more lonely and more isolated. Um, so, so, so you know, what's your diagnosis? And and also, in, presumably, this is this is all part of your argument that we're all we're all feeling less known in a way. And if we're all feeling less known, then what impact is this having upon? politics and society yeah well as i was becoming more human a little uh, i think our societies were becoming more dehumanized mm. uh, and the forces of dehumanization are many i think social media has played a role uh politics and political polarization uh i think we in the media have played a role i think uh, we've discovered in the internet age in order to attract eyeballs we have to generate fear and anger yeah um and so we've set a public culture that is much nastier and it's just a fact that when we we evolved to live in bands of 150 people and we only felt safe when people around us were seeing us yeah and if when we have a sense that nobody's seeing us we're invisible then there's going to be a sense of existential anxiety and of course you're going to lash out and so i think a sadder society and a lonelier society becomes a meaner society and so i had a guy a restaurateur in new york tell me he has to kick people out of his restaurant Every week now for rude behavior, I said that never used to happen. Uh, my sister-in-law is a nurse, and she says our trouble at the hospital is uh, keeping staff. People, the patients have become so abusive that nurses burn out, and want to leave the profession. And so there's just been this uptick of meanness and hate crimes uh, at a time as our societies are becoming incredibly diverse. And so you walk down the street in London or in New York um, or in Paris or wherever. Um, what you see is incredible cultural diversity. And we did not evolve to live with this diversity. We evolved to live with people just like us. And it's, it's just harder to understand somebody who grew up in China or India or Kenya, uh, but it's worth it and it's doable. One of the things that I really um, disagree with is this thing called standpoint epistemology. You can't know my, unless you've lived my experience, you can't know me. Yeah. Yeah. And I just think it's it's wrong. There was a beautiful book uh, piece written in the New York Review of Books by Zadie Smith. And she recalled that when she would go into her friends' homes as a kid, she would tell herself stories. What would happen if I came into this home and I never left, if I joined this family? What would it be like to be Ghanaian or Swiss or Dutch? And she would tell this beautiful way to sort of get yourself in the minds of a different cultures. And I remember when I read that, I thought, that, what a great way to train yourself to see others across difference. I also thought, thank God I didn't become a novelist because I can't compete with that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, but that's true, isn't it? I mean, this, you know, standpoint epistemology. I mean, if, you, if you're going to um, sign up to that, then throw away all your novels because, because that's, that's what a novelist does. And a novelist imagines themselves into the life of, a, of another person. You know, maybe their first novel is, is a thinly disguised autobiography. Right. But you're going to run out of that material pretty quickly. And, 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 and yeah, it seems to me that that's just a, another manifestation of xenophobia. It's, it's another manifestation right. of get off my land, get out of my intellectual tribal space. I, I agree. I think it's a... I think it's a it, it's an inherently toxic idea, and I think it comes out of xenophobia. It's just a fashionable manifestation um, of it. Yeah. Uh, we're coming to the end of our our, our, our time. Um, I, I want to talk quickly about generativity because that's a really important idea idea to, that comes towards the end of the end of the book. You know, what is generativity? Why is it important? How do we do it? Yeah, that put, that chapter is on one of the things. If I'm going to know you, I should know what life task you're in the middle of. So kids are in the, the middle of proving they have efficacy. Um, it's called industry versus, uh, I forget. It's like, it's 
little boys or little girls need to show I can do stuff. And so they're, that's their life task. Then when we get to be adolescents or teenagers, we're in an interpersonal phase mm -hmm. where what really matters to us is our friendships and our peers really define us. And we almost don't have a self without the peers. And then in middle age, many of us have a life task of con career consolidation, which is I'm trying to make it in the world. And when we're in that life task, we tend to close up a little emotionally. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I think sometime at age 50 or 60, there's some, there's this generativity in, instinct that really seizes people. And I tell college students, you know how in like when you were 13 or 14 or 15, the sex drive just suddenly appeared, you suddenly became horny all the time. Something happens to old people at 60, they become horny to give back. Uh, and they really, they want to give back. And so generativity is this obligation that I think a lot of old people feel um, that I, I need to leave something behind for the next generation. Uh, it's the self, I've, a lot of that self aggrandizement is just stale to me now. And I measure myself by my surrender. And so I'm actually teaching a class this spring in Chicago with my wife for people age 50 to 70 of how they move from their career to their next third of their life. Wow. And it's, it's a, and I've been interviewing people going through the middle of this process and it's a, it's a whole change in consciousness. It's really a change of like, I'm driving, I'm acquiring, I'm building, I'm instrumental. And it's a change to, I'm a servant. Uh, I can, I can fail big. I mean, I had a woman who was a prosecutor and now she wrote a play on about Anne Boleyn, Henry VIII's wife. And she said, I can fail big. Who gives a crap? I'm 65. And so that's like a freeing, a liberated attitude. Um, and so uh, I think that cause, that transition to generativity is a beautiful one, but sometimes a hard one. And I write in the book, I'm in the middle, sort of stuck halfway, halfway, because yeah. I wrote this book, The Second Mountain, about how little you should care about money and material things. I'm still wound up checking my Amazon ranking every hour to see how I was selling. So mm -hmm. I'm, I've got a long way to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's hard. But but it's interesting because, you know, it makes me think about what evolutionary psychology, where, where they where they find about the role of grandparents in the tribes who yes, grew sir. up in, that grandparents were instrumental in the raising of the children. And and, and um, the, the, it, it was much more about the expression of wisdom, the expression of these are the rules of the tribe. These are the things you need to learn about the bigger, you know, life's bigger picture and yeah. so so you do wonder if that's connected this, this this shift in consciousness that you describe where we we sort of go into this ain't very ancient grandparent mode yeah I, I definitely think that you know when i would ask my students to write papers about the people who really formed them or really knew them um the number one type of answer i would get were grandparents somebody nobody ever mentioned their own parents but wow. they mentioned their grandparents as this person was the wise person who really led me and this person you know, you know, wisdom is not like just uttering maxims. Yeah. I have a section in the book that wisdom is about the ability to be tenderly receptive, to get the story someone is telling them and hear them even more honestly than they may have told it. And so a quick little example of that is if anybody remembers the movie Goodwill Hunting, mm -hmm. Matt Damon plays uh, math, math whiz and Robin Williams plays a therapist. And the Matt Damon rips to shreds Robin Williams's whole persona and he pulls him out to a pond the next day and he says, you know, the Robin Williams character says, when I look at you, I don't see a confident man. I see a scared kid unless you want to talk about and there's nothing from about you. I can't learn from some book. And then he says, unless you want to talk about you, who you are, then I'd be fascinated. But you don't want to do that because you're terrified of what you might say. And that to me is a speech born of great wisdom, because first he's heard the thing the Matt Damon character has spent the whole movie trying to hide. Mm. which is he's terrified by life. Mm. And he said, I know this about you. I put it on the table. It's going to be okay. And then he gives them a direction in which to grow. As the f phrase goes, let other people voluntarily evolve. Don't try to change them. Uh, and so he says, you have, there are two kinds of knowledge in the world. There's the kind you can get from books, yeah, which is important. We write them. Uh, and then there's the kind of knowledge you get from living from suffering, from having a relationship and getting dumped by being in a war. And he says to him, you lack the second kind of knowledge, personal knowledge. And so he really is critiquing with care and just saying, here's what you need. And so that's, to me, that the, uh, that speech is an example of great tender receptivity, really hearing the struggle the other person is going through.
Yeah, I mean that was the really, really the sort of the final, um, really um, profound argument that you make in the book. This the, this redefinition of wisdom from you know as you're right, we traditionally see wise people as being like Yoda or Dumbledore. You know they're up on the you know yeah. with with a great beam from heaven giving out lessons from life but, <laughs> right. but actually it's it, it, you know it's it's not about that it, it, it's about something else so so, so I, th- I think that was a really sort of beautiful way of kind of closing the book and just just in our final sort of couple of minutes I just wonder if you could sort of wrap it all up by you, you know if you wanted to really distill it down into its essence what what are the kind of three or four big sort of takeaway points you want people to know like if you want to answer the question how do we really know a person what, what what are the three or four things that we need to sort of go away and, and really build into our lives? Yeah. Well, the first is the gaze. Yeah. Uh, and I um, tell the story in the book of a, a guy named, I'm having breakfast in Waco, Texas, and with a 93-year-old lady named LaRue Dorsey. And there's a mutual friend of ours walks into the, the diner and sees her. And she's been presenting herself to me like a drill sergeant, this stern disciplinarian, tough lady. And he goes up to her, grabs her by the shoulder, uh, and shakes her way harder than you should take a 93-year-old and says, Mrs. Dorsey, Mrs. Dorsey, you're the best, you're the best, I love you, I love you. And that stern disciplinarian I'd been talking to turned into a bright, eye-shining nine-year-old girl. Wow. And so the lesson is the power of attention, just how do you gaze upon the world? How do you attend to the world? Uh, the second thing is just the power of great conversation. Yeah. That the, the It's easy to have mediocre conversations. We do it all the time. But to have a memorable conversation. Uh, and when you were talking about the diversity, you know, I was thinking I once had a great conversation recently. Um, right here, I'm sitting in my living room. And we, I, we asked in the middle, how do your ancestors show up in your life? Mm. So how does your Dutch heritage show up? How does your black heritage, a couple of black or a Jewish heritage? Mm. Um, or um, if this five years in your life is a chapter, what's this chapter about? Uh, And I had a guy who's an 80-year-old political scientist. Uh, We were at dinner with like six people, and he said, I probably got one project in me. What should it be? And that started a conversation about his interests, his passions, but also about old age, how to die well. And it was these bigger conversations just open up and the process of really getting to know someone. So it's being that skilled at conversation. Great. Oh, it's been wonderful talking to you, David. Um, We're going to move on to some questions now from... Uh, the audience, which I should, if this has worked, have been sent. Um, okay, I've got one question here. I think there's some more in the, there's one saying Q&A. So I'll just ask the first question uh, from Andrew. As many of the skills you discuss tend to be, discuss tend to be acquired over time, do you have any suggestions for authentically learning or applying them at pace, like getting there quickly? I think he's trying yeah. to say. I think, yeah, I, I don't, I mean, I do think they are acquired over time, but I think a lot of them should be taught in schools. Like I, I think in, in age 15, you, it, there should be a class in like just basic social skills. Like, like the ones I've mentioned before, how do you um, end a conversation gracefully? Mm. How do you ask a, a person out? How do you break up with them without crushing their heart? Uh, so young people have had these skills who have had the ability to um, say, know how to break up with someone or know how to treat a teacher with the right level of deference and respect, but also familiarity. Like these are all skills. And a lot of the people I think are just are not taught the skills. But I will say when people are, you know, that I used to teach at Yale because I only taught at schools I couldn't have gone on into. Um, and so my students, some of them were just phenomenal at a certain sort of what's known in prep school world as ease, the ability to sidle up to an authority figure yeah. in a way that feels cool, but is also completely suck up. <laughs> so they were like so skilled at this too skilled. But uh, I think, you know, we could all learn these skills easily and save ourselves a lifetime of misery. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I have this a similar experience. I went to a very bad school, a comprehensive school in the UK. And when I went into the went into the world of journalism and started, started to meet people who'd been to the posh schools and had been to Oxford and Cambridge, I, I, I figured out, it seemed to me that what they'd learned wasn't really anything academic. It was this ease, as you you put it, like there's absolute confidence in themselves. And you just think, 
they, they could walk into any meeting and command respect and it's like yeah. where did where did you learn that i wish yeah. i could you know i wish yeah. i could learn that so yeah wonderful i i, I agree i mean to, to be taught this stuff at school would be would be wonderful um so yeah i i we've got loads of questions now i, I we've got fun of being fun with you thank you andrew for that uh next question is from patricia and patricia asks um if adept social skills don't guarantee authenticity how can we prioritize authenticity Hmm. I'm not sure I quite understand that um, question. Yeah, I, well, I, the, at least in my mind, it raises the issue: okay. is this all fake? <laughs> like, <Okay. laughs> is social skills make you're you're like play acting? Okay. Um, and I guess my initial, I haven't thought too much about it, but it's a good question. Is um, none of us are that good actors? Maybe you know a few Meryl Streep is that good an actor or somebody, but most of us we do better being ourselves. So the the process of um, of really getting to know someone. You have to be willing to reveal yourself. Uh, in order to behold someone, you have to be willing to be beheld. And if you're, if in my dualism, if you're a diminisher and the other person's illuminator, then they're not going to be able to get you to be a to see others. You're just you're just all walled up. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to have a relationship, it has to be two people revealing vulnerably and honestly who they really are, and there there has to be reciprocity. So I think. It's one authentic self looking at another authentic self. Though I will say, when you really get to know people, you I'm you learn a lot more about who you are. I'm, I think one of the things I learned in the book is for a lot of people, a lot of researchers think introspection is highly unreliable. That yeah. when we look inside our own selves and try to tell the story about ourselves, mostly we're having intellectual breakthroughs that are fake uh, or else we're ruminating, we're just spiraling into ourselves. And so I think most of the researchers think if you really want to know something about yourself, go out and talk to somebody else and then compare notes. Yeah. <laughs> How do you see this? How do I see this? Brilliant. Thank you, Patricia. Um, next question is is really good. So Victoria asks, any advice on how to connect with a boss who is a diminisher? Or we could say anybody. You know, if we've got a, a diminisher in our lives, how do we cope with that? Yeah, I, I, it's tough. It's a tough one. Um, I um, start with curiosity into them, their life and hoping they'll reciprocate with a little curiosity. Um, the second thing is I start by betraying a little vulnerability, not a lot, just a little. I'm uncertain about this to see if they can sit there with you. Mm -hmm. And then I, you know, I start, I, I do the take, take me back technique. I just, we might be chatting and it's like, take me back to your childhood. Like, who were you as a kid? What do you want to do? And I find people love talking about their childhood. And if those three techniques don't work, good luck. <laughs> you know, I, I just, I, if somebody doesn't want to open up and that means they're afraid of, of, of opening up uh, or they don't think it's proper, uh, then the, I found there's not much you can do. But I will say as the person who's been in authority, I found just a little bit of vulnerability goes a long way. So I was teaching a class, this was like 10 years ago or so. Mm -hmm or maybe eight years ago. And um, the woman who was now my wife, I was courting her. And she was coming to New Haven to uh, tell me whether she would marry me or not. Uh, and I didn't tell this to the class. I just said, I, I can't go to attend office hours tonight, because I'm dealing with something personal. That's all I said. And that evening of the 24 students in the seminar, about 18 emailed me and said, Professor Brooks, I just want you to know, I'm thinking about you, I'm praying for you. And that little bit of vulnerability changed the tenor of the class the whole term. Wow. Because we just, I wasn't just austere Professor Brooks. I was just another schmo getting through life. And I think that in the workplace, we don't want to be completely spill our guts in the workplace. But in my view, most of us are not open enough. We should be a little more open than we are. Uh, and it'll improve the workplace. And uh, so the idea being that openness breeds openness. It hopefully we'll, we'll we'll nudge into being a a culture of a little bit more openness absolutely right okay thank you victoria that was a great question so next from um kieran so kieran writes david on your journey from being harsh stroke closed off to softer stroke more open what were the reactions of the people around you did you lose people along the along the way and how did you cope with this with this especially in relation to your faith yeah, I, I don't think I lost too many people. There are some people I remember I, I, when I was getting more open, I did have conversations with friends and I found they just couldn't go there. Like, you know, I I had one conversation, I recall, with a friend who's a foreign policy expert uh, and 
I think I started talking, I was going through a divorce, so I started talking about it over lunch. And he, it was as if I had set fire to his uh, private parts. Uh, <laughs> uh, he, he, uh, he just like, ah, terror, terror. <laughs> and so uh, I think a lot of people um, go into public policy because they don't want to deal with private policy <laughs> and they're, they're just avoiding what's inside. And so they go into public policy. They think they'll save the world without dealing with themselves. Um, and, but I generally found my friendships were much deeper and I, I learned things like even last two weeks, this is not a friendship is sort of semi-professional relationship. I had lunch over the years, many times with a Senator and he's pretty, very conservative Republican. Uh, and, this time he happened to mention that his wife is really ill and dying. Uh, and it was just moving for to see this side of a person. I had no clue about that side of a person. And I, I would say that's one of the rewards of going through life in this manner. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kieran. So next question is from Arnie. And Arnie asks, would you say that the most important thing about almost any relationship is that the other person makes you feel good about yourself and that you make them feel feel good about themselves yeah or honest with about it you know I, I do think you have to there has to be some feeling of I mean I say when I coach my students about how to think about the marriage decision and one of my things I always say is a marriage is a multi-decade conversation pick someone you could talk to forever but the other thing I say is uh, love comes and goes but admiration stays so marry someone you admire and that that is a great part of marriage, but you don't uh, you don't want to practice what they call idiot compassion, which was nothing but positivity. Uh, you, there has to be some critiquing with care, uh, and there's a there's a saying I learned that when two people get married, there's or or just even enter into a relationship, they start with stars in their eyes, and then about six months into the relationship, uh, you realize that the other person is actually kind of selfish in many ways. And as they're, you're making this realization about them, they're making it about you. Uh, and so the relationship is only going to work if both people uh, decide, well, my own selfishness is the problem here. So I'm going to work on my own selfishness. That's the only selfishness I can really control. So you don't want to totally ignore the fact that we're, we tend to be selfish creatures uh, and we want to acknowledge each other's selfish points and have honest conversations about it. But hopefully you do it in the context of unstinting and unconditional love. Yeah, exactly. So, so honesty and authenticity, as well as the making feel, people feel um, good about themselves. All right. Thank you, Arnie. So this next question is um, from Anonymous. Ooh. How <laughs> best can we balance being open and being self-protecting in cases where the other person has worked against you or your instinct tells you that the other person does not have your best interests at heart? So how to know an yeah. enemy, you know, yeah, <laughs> essentially. Right. So I first want to thank Gordon Brown for the question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, you know, it, it's a fair question. And my my um, my line is that it's a brutal world these days. Uh, and but it's still practical to, it, to lead with trust. Yeah. And that people, if you lead with trust, most of the time, people will show up for you and behave in trustworthy ways. Sometimes you'll be betrayed, but it's worth a price to be paid. And it's not naive to lead with curiosity. It's not practical to not understand the other people around you. So a lot of the stuff I'm talking about in the book may seem naive and woo-woo, but to me, even in these brutalizing times, the only solution, even if we're fighting over Gaza or we're fighting over whatever Brexit or, or uh, the Iraq war or anything, or Donald Trump, um, uh it's it, the only effective way to have a relationship in these brutalizing time is to lead with the kind of skills I'm talking about. Because uh, once we detach the human uh, connection, uh, then we really lost it. And so, for example, uh, if we're arguing about something, there's probably something deep down that we agree upon. Uh, you, you know, like in the years gone by when Brexit happened, you may be pro-Brexiteer and anti or Remainer. Um, but there's, you probably both want what's best for the people of Great Britain. And so if you can keep returning to the thing you actually agree upon, that gem statement, you save a relationship amid disagreement. And so there are techniques and skills for disagreeing well. Uh, and even in brutalizing times, I think it's worth it to lead with trust and then figure out how to disagree well. 
Yeah, and I, and I think sort of going back to some of the things you write about in How to Know a Person, that that's where the narrative mode of inquiry is so yeah. helpful because again, I found as a journalist that when you actually sit down in an open-hearted way and say, "Tell me your story" to people that you don't agree with, you, you know, you don't. I mean, I, I've written about actual Nazis. You know, you, you don't, you don't, you don't, you know, Holocaust Nazis. You don't walk away agreeing with them. But you walk away thinking, "Okay, I can understand how you. I can understand." the story that you tell about the world and and often right. these people that begin that, that seem like monsters when you meet them at a distance they just seem like they seem they seem like humans yeah. who are just making a terrible mistake um yeah. and and so that i think that's why the narrative mode that you describe is you know is so is so valuable okay so in the last couple of minutes we've got one more question from another anonymous uh the final question then david is is it a human trait that we readily that we readily believe someone is caring and empathetic when they might not be. So is this a human kind of failing or trait that we are maybe credulous um, to other people's caring and empathetic? Uh, it depends what we've learned. And so, you know, I do think, as I write in the book, that babies come out of the womb looking for a face to see them. Mm. That the first human quest is the quest for recognition. Yeah. And it, it, some of you may have gone online and see these still-faced experiments where they take babies and they take moms and they tell moms not to mo emotionally react to anything their baby does. So the baby is bidding for attention and the mom just sits there still face. And if you watch these videos for the first five seconds, the babies are sort of upset and curious. And and then suddenly they're angry, furious, complete. They collapse into agony. Mm -hmm. That if we don't feel seen, then we're just going to collapse into agony. And so I think we have this human need for recognition but if it's been betrayed, if we've had relationships that have betrayed us, then we're going to see the our world, our models will be filled with betrayal and we'll see threat everywhere. And we'll see threat even when it doesn't exist. And so there's an organization in Baltimore that surrounds underperforming kids in the Baltimore schools with a bunch of volunteers uh, to help them basically serve as extended families. And the kids have been betrayed so much by life, they they push the volunteers away. And the rule of thread, this organization is you keep showing up. There's no exit. Unless they get a court order, you're going to show up day after day at the door, knocking on the door saying, let me take you to school here. I brought you some lunch. And the they, one woman who works there said it's identity changing when somebody shows up for you after you've rejected them. And it's identity changing to, for the one who was rejected. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's altering, again, the models of the mind. Is the world trustworthy? Is the world trustworthy? Is it not? And I think life teaches us an answer to that question one way or the other. Wonderful. Oh, well, David, it's been such a amazing hearing to hearing you talk. Thank and again, you. uh, it, it, and thanks for everybody for showing up, uh, this evening or whatever time it is where, where, where you are showing up. Uh, if you haven't bought David's book yet, how to know a person, I'm, I'm you've got a taste of it. Um, uh, of the last hour, it's, it's a really wonderful thing. So go away and buy it if you haven't already. And, uh, thank you uh, for being here with us, uh, today, tonight, David. No, oh, well, it's been a pleasure, a real pleasure to get a chance to electronically meet you, and someday we'll do it over a pint. Perfect. Thanks, David. See you.